Hello, this is Mr. Ferreira, and I am recording this ASH experiment lesson, and it says Studies in Conformity, and it was published in 1951. Now, ASH actually builds, builds his whole career on looking into this type of research, and um, certainly there's a number of studies that we look at, including some variations that we'll do after we've done this. But what we need to perhaps take a note of is this idea of disregarding an obvious right answer. Now, this was really important for Ash because he had looked at research such as Jenin's beans in a jar, where he asked participants to kind of guess the beans in the jar, but there's no obvious right or wrong answer there. He's just showing that he can influence people's responses. There's also a very famous study by Mustafa Sheriff that looks at the autokinetic effect where people do conform to the group. But of course, what they're staring at is a, is a beam of light that doesn't move, but of course, it does appear to, to move. And, and therefore, once again, it's ambiguous. So Ash then sets up his work in order to establish quite clearly that people may or he might have thought may not conform when there's an obvious right answer. So let's have a look at uh, a video which shows um, the Ash experiment. It's a remake of the of of the experiment done in the 1970s. The acting is really cheesy and bad, but certainly does give us a flavour of how Ash ran his work. The Ash experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example, if you... The actors right have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ASH experiment has been repeated many times, and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat. So we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. Okay, so we can see very clearly that Ash had come up with quite a simple plan um, and he runs his experiment in a way in which he presents the participants with a set of cards. On one card is what he calls a standard line and he then expects them to make reference to the comparison lines and say what does it matched. So in this particular case, it's quite obvious that C would be the answer. But of course, he gets his group of Confederates, people who are in on the experiment, to say that it's a different line. Okay, so if they if they say A or B in this particular context, it's clearly a wrong answer. Now, of course, it doesn't matter that I've got ABC there. And in the video, they did one, two, three. I'm under the impression that actually it was ABC in the original study. You're very seldom asked to outline the procedure, but certainly if you can remember the video, it should be quite straightforward to do it if they say, well, how did Ash study conformity? Now, the other pieces of information that we need to know is that it was 50 American male undergraduate students. Now, 
there are going to be different numbers of students in different studies because he's published his work repeatedly, but I'm focusing on the original work where there are 50 students. We also see that he refers to the participant as being naive. In other words, they have not um, experienced the situation, so therefore they are naive. But there's also confederates. These are people who are in on the study and they're trying to, uh, or they're deliberately giving a, a wrong answer. Now, we don't need to worry too much about that it was just male and undergraduate students. I think this was quite a kind of common for the time being. There are very few female students um, in universities in America in the 1950s, um, and therefore it would have been pretty normal. Ash um, is also not deliberately kind of say anything when we look at um, gender issues and biases um, in year 13, you might want to consider whether this has affected the outcome, whether he assumed that males and females would act the same. We also don't need to worry about the six to eight confederates because it is literally um, difficult to, to organize this. We have to do this particular kind of kind of role play 50 times and, and possibly sometimes the confederates didn't turn up. And so therefore the 68 is just probably done to that. What we do know quite clearly is that the um, actual participant was always kind of put as last or second to last. This was just to kind of make the whole situation convincing and also give the participants something in order to conform to in terms of the rest of the group. And they were calling out their answers and therefore it was quite obvious what the other people had decided before you got to the participant. We also know that um, that they didn't always give the wrong answer. For the first couple, they would have given the correct answer. So we can then say that they had 18 trials. What I mean by trials is that there was 18 situations where there are cards and they're asked to express the answer. Okay, so for some of them, they were correct. So therefore, we can't assume that we're looking at conformity there. We actually could test to see whether they're reading the lines like the rest of the people in the room. But for 12 of them, and we say these are called critical trials, they did test for conformity. And in other words, the Confederates gave a deliberate wrong answer and we're seeing whether the participant would change their answer. So therefore, you could say that if there's 50 participants and 12 times they were asked for conformity, we have 600 trials. And the only reason this is important is if we look at the findings. The first one, in terms of findings, says that 36.8% of the time they gave the wrong answer. Now, this is not 36.8% of the participants. If we look at the 600 critical trials, and we can count them all together, is that 36.8% of the time they gave the wrong answer. Now, this is actually a small number, but quite significant if you consider that they were giving the wrong answer and it was very obvious that they were giving the wrong answer. So they conformed to something that was obviously wrong. The next two bullet points are what happens in terms of the participants. We see that a quarter of them didn't conform at all. And this is quite interesting and in why we look at resistance to conformity later on in the course. But we see that quite a large number, 75% of them conformed at least once. Now that becomes important, this at least once, because in the 12 critical trials, they may not have conformed all the time. They might have conformed some of the time, or the pressure might have grown till they got to the point where they decide, okay, I need to now conform. So what we then have is a picture of the study, kind of how he did it. We have the findings there. And the last piece to put into place is he did ask them kind of why. Okay, so we look at interviewing his participants and they say that they wanted to avoid rejection. And this is really quite important to us. It means that we can go back to our normative social influence peak paragraph and we can add the C, this time it's a continuation, and we can say, well, actually, Ash's research does actually confirm that people do conform in order to avoid rejection. We see that when he interviews his participants, this is exactly what they say. Of course, you can change your wording according to kind of what suits you. So what we have there is pretty much a quite a simple study, a clear outline of what they did and the findings. 
and you could be expected to refer to it. We also then would go on to what we call variations of ASH experiments, and these can be found in the next video, and I will kind of do them at a later stage within the lesson. What I'm going to do now is look at the evaluation points. So in other words, is there any value that we can place on the ASH experiment? Now, if we look at the first evaluation point, it is a criticism. And I have noticed that many of the studies like ASH, which are still around now, I tend to be quite critical about. And I suppose because there's not, um, it's kind of like accepted as something which happens. So I suppose we end up being a bit more critical. But this criticism says it's only relevant for a particular time period. Okay, and that's important. So what we see there is a reference to something called a child of its time. This is from a documentary that followed people's lives over a period of time. And it said, as time changes, context changes, situation changes, and the lives of the participants changed in that particular case. And so when we kind of are being critical about something maybe only being relevant to a particular group of people and a particular time period, we could refer to it as being a child of its time. So what we do know, and you can't, I can't change this particular fact, is that the participants were all American males and of a particular culture and a particular time. And so the criticism here is this idea, of, is it unique to that particular group? And you may ask this question to yourself. Think about it. If you had to run conformity research now in 2020, would you have a different kind of outcome? Now, of course, I'm trying to build this as a peak paragraph. And so I do actually have some research by Perrin and Spencer, who did the research in the 1980s. So nearly 30 years after Ash. OK, and what we find is that we've changed several things. So we've changed the students to engineering students. We've changed the time, but it's also now in the United Kingdom. And the big difference here is that it's only one student that conforms. So a significantly big difference from what we found from Ash in 1951. We found that it was 75 of percent of the participants conformed at least once. Now we only have one of them. OK, so this could be overwhelming evidence that maybe it is unique and a child of its time. But when we're looking into this, of course, I'm trying to formulate an idea for you to think about. I also know that Perrin and Spencer did other research in 1984 and found similar results to Ash. And all that they changed this time was instead of having engineering students, is they had young people that had been trouble with the law, delinquents. And so when we start thinking about, OK, so what is going on with the ash? There's definitely a possibility that, that the 1950s were also particularly conformist. So therefore, maybe there's some validity to the point that it is a child of its time. But also, some of you eagle-eyed students would have kind of figured out that maybe an engineering student is not the correct student to do this particular conformity work with because they need to be quite confident about measuring lines. But also underneath this, we have this concern about McCarthyism. Because in the 1950s in America, there, it was a special time. There's a genuine fear of communism. And if a person expressed any leanings or anything that kind of supported communism, they were potentially going to have problems. And so what I have is two videos that hopefully will demonstrate that for you. So the first video is about a singer who was very popular at, at, at the time um, in, in America and around the world. Um, but as soon as he starts expressing communist views, see there's a genuine anti communist sentiment and, and lots of really conflicting ideas where America were kind of being kind of forced to kind of endure this propaganda about kind of, you know, everything that they do is being right. So I know it might seem quite ironic that, you know, 70 years later in America, we seem to have kind of a similar kind of issue going on. But it certainly highlights potentially this concern that if you express any views that are different, 
um, that, that there could be problems. Now, the second video is to kind of show you kind of kind of who this McCarthy person is and kind of the idea that he set up these trials to accuse people of potentially being communists. From 1950 to 1954, a junior senator from the rural state of Wisconsin became one of the most powerful and influential figures in US politics. In this program, we're going to use film from the archive to examine the rise and fall of Senator Joseph McCarthy. There is only one issue of communists in our government. I am not a communist. Have you no decency, sir? Just how important did McCarthy become? This next clip comes from a documentary made in the 1980s, and it gives us a sense of how prominent McCarthy became. And at the head of the parade appeared this man, Joseph R. McCarthy, the junior senator from Wisconsin. Looking for an issue that would get him reelected, he seized on the fears of millions and launched the squalid campaign that became known as McCarthyism. Its tactic, reckless and undocumented accusations against government employees. Intimidation bred audacity, and audacity fed upon itself. McCarthy soon had the celebrity he sought. The stage was his alone to command. What conditions allowed McCarthy to become... So that video demonstrates that this junior senator kind of set up this kind of witch hunt um, of communists. And that would have been the background of what these students in the 1950s would have known. People who were accused of being a communist had their careers destroyed and potentially um, standing out from the crowd would have been something which nobody would have wanted to do. So for me, this does highlight the genuine kind of concept or idea that maybe Ash's research is something which is unique to the particular time frame. And therefore, it would be not consistent across the situation. And this is a problem because ultimately, um, Ash was saying that it was a fundamental feature of human behavior, that we have this tendency to want to kind of conform to obviously kind of wrong answers when we're put under a particular pressure to conform. So it's quite a damning point we have there. And I suppose part of me just needs to kind of remind you that we are still looking at Ash's research now, it's nearly 70 years later. So therefore maybe Ash and what we call the Ash paradigm could really be something which is a lot more powerful than you think. Though I am gonna continue with the evaluation points and I see that my next point is a um, another kind of genuine criticism, but it now takes a different approach rather than kind of saying, well, maybe it was a particular time frame. It says that maybe Ash's research was invalid. And in psychology, something is valid if it does what it's intended to do. So by me saying that there's a problem with its validity, it means that potentially it didn't test for conformity. And the reason I'm saying this is because it says here the Confederates being convincing. So this experiment only works if the Confederates are being convincing. If you're a participant and you suspect that something might be going on, perhaps something called demand characteristics, where I can go, okay, so I know what they're looking for. So therefore I'm gonna help the experimenter. So as soon as I do that, the experiment is not valid because I've changed my behavior to suit what's going on in the experiment. Now, of course, there's also the opposite effect. They could say, well, screw you, I'm not gonna help. But once again, that's not very helpful. And once again, becomes invalid because I'm not doing what I would normally do. So the question is, how convincing were them? Were the Confederates? Okay, because if they weren't convincing, then potentially the results may be invalid. Now, what, what I can't do is I can't go back and I can't interview people who were part of that particular study because they probably are not alive at the moment. And if they are, they will have very little memory or they might not be able to recall correctly what happened. So this is a real problem, which I can't really answer. But psychology being the subject that it is, there are people who are quite creative. And I really like the following piece of evidence. 
Maury and Aria in 2010 try to overcome this issue of having confederates that need to act. And what they did is they gave their participants special glasses. It looks a bit like this. Okay. With 3D technology, we can now have, in this particular case, there's five people in the picture. I'm pretty certain that the glasses weren't quite as cheesy as those, but I can certainly get it that maybe four out of those five participants see the image in one way, one way and then one of the participants sees the image in another way. So therefore, everyone's a participant, but only one person I'm testing for conformity. And they are seeing the line differently to the others. So therefore, the Confederates aren't lying. They are simply just trying to express what they see. Now, this comes from a study that I read in the BPS Digest. Now, the BPS is the British Psychological Society. You can see it up there. And if you do a psychology degree, you can have graduate membership, um, as, as I do, and you can take part in their training. You can also, if you become a clinical psychologist, um, you have to have BPS accreditation, and it's really quite good. The importance for you is that they, on a weekly basis, you see here a weekly email, they give an email out to us kind of highlighting and summarizing um, some of the research that's around um, in kind of in very kind of small kind of kind of chunks like this okay and also have links half the time to the actual piece of research so you can read it if you want to so i think this is um, absolutely brilliant and all of you can sign up to it and certainly get a bit of information on uh, from the bps digest so going back to this particular study were the confederates convincing or not well in this particular case they actually get a very similar results it says here very similar results to ash. So in other words, it is potential, potentially, I should say, that the Confederates did indeed act in a convincing way. What is also quite interesting, that's 2010, and we're getting similar results to ash. So it could be that the ash paradigm or the situation where people do conform is something that might actually be a lot more universal than we thought. We see here also I make reference to page 19 in your textbook that you can find online and a study by Crutchfield, because this also takes this idea that maybe having face-to-face -face participants is what the problem was with the ASH research. So Crutchfield back in 1953 or something like that, it was, it was a very similar time to ASH, um, creates these phone booths where the participants go in and they have a set of lights in front of them that kind of represent other, partic other participants in the study. And as they light up, they're then meant to put their light, whether it's one, two, three, or A, B, C. So even when there's not face-to-face -face kind of pressure of a group, Crutchfield actually discovered that people do conform in a very similar way to what Ash kind of said. So then the last kind of issue that we can look at in terms of Ash, and this will apply to his variations as well. And this is also something I can't answer. So then invalidity, I've sort of answered and said, well, actually, when we take away the Confederates, we do actually get to the point where people do the same as what Ash. But this is the only one I can't change. Certainly, the experiment was artificial. You probably never need to or never will have an opportunity to express which line you think matches a series of lines that you have. And of course, that means that if I go with the group and I conform or I don't go with the group, there are absolutely and categorically no consequences of my actions. Therefore, you can go along if you wish to. Now, this also links to demand characteristics because they might have actually just said, oh, this is ridiculous and decided to go along with it. And so it's worth having a consideration. Fisk, in the next slide, also worries about how group-like the group really were, because they didn't act like a group. Very seldom will you actually be in a group and people will express their ideas out loud, out loud and then for you to kind of, um, kind of say what you want to do. And so it's worth having a look at that particular research. And it is kind of highlighted by Burns on the same page as the Crutchfield research in your books. So that for me 
is is genuinely quite interesting. So it could be ultimately that we can't generalize the ash research to what we call everyday situations. Maybe people don't conform in every day in the same way as they would conform in the laboratory. Because maybe everyday conformity is about friendship. Maybe everyday conformity is about pressure to fit in. Maybe everyday conformity is not so much about lines. So the last thing I'd like to say about this is I haven't even added it into this, but what happens if the conformity was about something that was morally right and wrong? Maybe if you find some money and you're in a group, would that make a difference? For some of you, you would think, well, no, of course, if I want the money, I'll take the money. But for others, it could be more important if it was life and death. So hopefully you've seen that there's actually quite a lot of different ideas that you can think about in terms of Ash, both an understanding of his research and also an understanding of the concerns behind it. To finish with, I just want to highlight once again a Mind Changes episode um, on Solomon Ash, and this time I'm going to take you to the website because I think some of the previous links might not have worked. If you do click on the link, you come to this particular, and you can search this in the BBC, it's Radio 4, and you get Mind Changes, and you see all the episodes are, are kind of less than half an hour, and this is actually a particularly good one. It's one of the, I think, the earlier ones that she did. Now, if you click on episodes, we see I've got kind of four pages there of of different um, kind of podcasts that you can li listen to. Um, some of the newer ones from like Carol Dweck, uh, Dweck and Growth Mindset, certainly something that Mr. Duncan would have listened to and, and would be interesting. A lot of you refer to Maslow um, for some reason in your test, and therefore you might want to listen to that one. But overall, there's lots for you to listen to, including the, the Solomon Ash one. There we go. I thank you for listening to this and I will come back uh, with another video on the variations of ash. Um, and this is where I'm going to leave it. Thank you and good night.